Turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 5. Are you ready for the word? Well, that wasn't too good. Are you ready for the word? The word is life. The word is our rock, our foundation. Amen. The word of God is the will of God. People say, Pastor, I just don't know what God's will is. Huh? Pastor Robin used to tell me the answer for that. He said, you got a Bible, don't you? Amen? If you got a Bible, you got God's will. I don't know if God wants me to be blessed. Does it say in His Word He wants you to be blessed? Then He wants you to be blessed. I don't know if it's God's will for me to be healed of my sickness. Did Christ take stripes on His back for the healing of your body? Then that's God's will for your life. Somebody say amen. Amen. His word is his will. Quit making it so hard. Amen. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, text me and said, help me pray. I've got a job opportunity to make more money than I've ever made in my life. So what the world do you want me to pray about? We proclaim every Sunday jobs and better jobs. Is it a better job than what you got now? Yeah. I said, follow your peace. What's your, what do you got a peace about? We make things too trivial. Too hard. Amen. It's not hard. You know, people used to say all the time, I get so frustrated. It's hard to be a Christian. Really? It's hard for me to not be a Christian. Amen. It's just easy to sin. No, it should be hard for you to sin. Because every time you start to sin, you ought to get this gut sickness. Amen. Sin feels good. No, it doesn't. Sin should make you sick because the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. Amen. He gets sick when we sin. It begins to feel good when you do it so much that that sickness goes away. And then you're in trouble. Somebody say amen. That's what happened to King Belshazzar. He's the son of King Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar was king when Daniel got thrown in the lion's den. Y'all remember that story? They said, you're going to bow before King Nebuchadnezzar. And they got him to form a decree and, 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 and sign it, put his signature on the decree that whoever doesn't bow to him at a certain time, they'll be thrown into the lion's den. Amen? And Daniel said, throw me where you want to throw me, but I got one God. And that's, all, that's the only one I'm going to bow to. And King Nebuchadnezzar loved Daniel so much, he didn't want to throw him in the lion's den, but he was caught between a rock and a hard place because he done opened his mouth Huh? Stephanie was telling me last night we were talking about a guy that uh, took three jars of rice. Have y'all saw that? He took three jars of rice, and you correct me if, if I'm wrong. Oh, she's going to correct me. <laughs> three jars of rice, and every day for a month, he got up, and to one jar, he spoke negativity on. He said, I hate you, I curse you, I hate you. The other jar, he didn't even acknowledge. And in the other jar, he spoke blessing on. I love you, I bless you, I love you. And within a month's time, the jar that he spoke cursings on, what did it do? Rotted. Rotted away. The jar he left alone and didn't say nothing to, molded. The jar that he spoke life to and love to got an aroma, a sweet aroma. The rice turned into a sweet aroma. Because there's power in our words. You got to watch what you say. And the king had opened his mouth and said something before he thought about it. So he had to throw Daniel in the lion's den, you remember? Then he was up all night and really concerned about Daniel. And early in the morning he runs to the lion's den, yells out for Daniel, has the God you serve saved you? Daniel said, King, 
all is well. Hallelujah. What should the end of your trials look like? Every trial you go through, the end should say the same thing. All is well. Hallelujah. You remember when that Shunammite woman couldn't have any kids and the prophet came to her and said, what do you want from the Lord? And ended up having a child. And when the child was 12 years old, fell sick and died. And the prophetess, the Shunammite woman said, hey, I'm going to see the prophet. Her, her son that was promised to her was dead. Her, she was having marriage problems. Y'all need to read the story. Goes to the prophet and the prophet comes out and salutes her and says, hey, how is your son? How is your husband? She said, all is well. Son dead. Why? She knew that what I'm dealing with now is not what the end of this thing's going to look like. Amen? Well, I'm preaching good today. This has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about. But it's good, amen? God says, all is well. Daniel says, all is well. And then God blessed Nebuchadnezzar, because he made a decree over his kingdom, we're going to serve Jehovah God, the God of Daniel. We're going to serve. And so God began to bless, and you can read about this in Daniel 5, because he reminds Belshazzar, which is Nebuchadnezzar's son, who is now king, that God blessed your dad when he put God first. Then what happens in, 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 in chapter 5 is Belshazzar has taken all the... the, the the temple's uh, goblets and all the things they ate from and drank from in the house of God. And now he's having parties and, and, and all this stuff and they're drinking alcohol and all this out of the, the temple instruments. Amen. That's what happens. We go, God, how could they do that? That's what happens when you use your body for sin. Y'all don't want me to preach to you today. Amen. Because we're the temple of God. Amen? So when we're okay with sin, it's no different than Belshazzar having them parties and using the temple's instruments for sin. Are you right? Am I right? And so they begin to do all these things and Daniel, then all of a sudden a hand comes and writes on the wall. Belshazzar sees this hand writing on the wall and he gets real disturbed and he calls in all the magicians and all the soothsayers and says, tell me what this hand has, has written on the wall. And none of them could tell because it was written by God, amen, and not by Satan, not by the enemy. And so they said, you know, a woman comes and says, look, Daniel can, can interpret it. They bring Daniel in. I love Daniel. First thing Daniel does before he ever reads the writing on the wall is he rebukes the king. We need some men of God and women of God that will stand up and even rebuke kings. Somebody say amen. amen. My wife and I have been through this this week on, on Facebook and stuff like that. God, that might be the devil's playground. I don't know. but we, you know, Because anytime a Christian stands up for right and wrong and, what, and the word of God, what we believe, we're judgmental. That's right. Come on. Come on. Preach. We're full of hate. Christians aren't supposed to be like that. The devil is a liar. That's right. I've said it and I'm going to say it again. The Word of God is our judge. Yes. And Paul teaches us to judge in the Spirit. Yes. Judge a tree by the fruit it bears. Yes. Right. If it's bearing wrong fruit, there is nothing. It is our obligation to stand up and say, that's wrong. That's right. Well, you're judging me. No, I'm not. I'm judging your fruit. Right. Come on. Somebody say amen. Amen. We need some more Daniels, amen? Yes. He stood up and rebuked the king. And then let's, let's look about verse uh, 23. 22 says, But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not, watch what he says, humbled your heart, although you knew all this. What is he talking about? He's, he's telling him, God gave your kingdom, your, your father, a kingdom and blessed the kingdom because he put God first. Amen? But then he started sinning against God again. He forsook God and God took his kingdom away. The Bible says he ended up out in the field eating grass. Went from the palace to eating grass. And he said, you know all these things, but you still have not humbled your heart. In verse 23, And you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, 
And they have brought the vessels of this house before you, you and your lords and your wives and your concubines and drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone. Which do you see and hear or know, or which do not see or hear or know? He said, you're serving these gods that can't hear you, can't see what you're going on, but you've made them gods. Isn't it funny what will make gods in our lives? He says, and the God who holds your breath mm, in his hand and owns all your ways. My Lord, there's a lot we could preach right here. <laughs> he, ownership shows possession. And Daniel said he owns your ways. It means you don't decide what your tomorrow holds. He does. Oh, Lord. Hold your breath in his hands, and you have not glorified him. Then the fingers of his hand were sent from him, and the writing is written in this. And this is the inscription that was written. Now watch this. This is the interpretation of each word. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekiel. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Peres, your kingdom has been divided and given to the, the, the Midianites and the Persians. Let's just stop there and look at verse 27. Tekiel, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Now, I don't have a whole lot of time to deal with this. I'm, I'm trying to build a foundation for you. He says to Belshazzar some things that are very important. Number one, he said, you've lifted up your heart. And he also talks about his mind. He said, you've turned your heart and your mind from God. Okay? Go back and read the chapter. You've turned your heart and your mind from God. And God has written on the wall, He's put your life on a scale. And you are found wanting which means your life is not producing enough to balance out for God to bless you and keep the protection of God upon you. Now, look in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22 quickly this morning. Matthew chapter 22. He said, you've lifted up your heart You've lifted up your mind. You're not serving God and you've been placed in a, on a scale. You've been placed in a balance and you've been found wanting. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees, they come to, to Jesus and they asked Him, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? This is verse 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? So now we're talking about the law of God. Which is the greatest commandment? Jesus said unto them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, which means your innermost feelings, your core feelings, with all your soul, which that word soul actually means your spirit. It means the breath of God, your spirit. So with your core innermost feelings and with your spirit and with all your mind, that means your deepest thoughts are where your thoughts originate from. So it says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. No commandment's bigger than another. Yes, it is. Jesus just told us. The greatest commandment is you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Now watch this. And the second is like unto this, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? Amen. So we're talking about love. Loving God and loving your neighbor. Now watch this next statement here. On these two commandments hangs all the law and the prophets. 
hangs. He's given us a picture of a scale. He's saying there's a scale and that scale hinges upon these two commandments. The scale of your life is hanging on these two commandments. All the laws in the old covenant hangs on these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. It also says, and the prophets hinge on this. What does that mean? All the prophecies of the word of God are hinged on loving God and loving your neighbor. So we're going to start this week and maybe the next couple of weeks and talk from the subject, love balances the scales. Here's what Jesus was telling them. They were trying to get him to say, which is the greatest commandment? They were hoping he'd say, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not commit adultery. They were always wanting him to, to say something negative. Jesus automatically goes to the positive and says, love God and love your neighbor. Love is so important that the whole law of God is hinged on this one concept. If you love God and love your neighbor, you will weigh positively in the scales of God. You may fail at some of the other commandments. He was saying, do you understand the concept and, and, and the the huge responsibility of keeping the law in the Old Covenant, we don't know because we're Gentile people. You know what I'm saying? They had to dress a certain way. They had to prepare certain sacrifices a certain way. They had to speak certain words at a certain time and do all these, all these rituals. And Jesus comes on the scene and says, all these rituals can be summed up and taken care of in two things. Love God and love your neighbor. If you don't wear the correct clothes and love God and love your neighbor, you'll still weigh positive in the scales of heaven. If you mess up and sin and commit a sin against the law, if you love God and love your neighbor, you'll still weigh positive in the scales of God. Oh, we don't like to hear this as Pentecostals. Holiness people. Come on, somebody. Huh? But that's what he says. Is that not what he says? Look at it. He says, love the Lord, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, and thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the saying is like unto this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, put it up there, on these two commandments hangs the law and the prophecies. All the commandments are hinging on, you. that, that means this as well. You can perform all the rituals. You can obey the Ten Commandments. And if you don't love God and love your neighbor, then you are negative in the scales of God. You can't tell me, I go to church every Sunday. I don't drink or hang around those that do. I don't smoke dope. I don't cuss out my kids. I don't commit adultery. I'm trying to think of these real big things that we say we're good Christians because we do or don't do. All the while, oh yeah. I, I, yeah, I, don't, I mean, Dennis is cool and all, but I don't like Dennis because Dennis is black. Oh, y'all don't want to get down to the real stuff. Huh? Oh, Pastor David's good, but he's white. We got prejudice in our heart. Somebody say amen. amen. Prejudice in our heart. You know, Lizette's cool, but she's Hispanic. And we look down on the Hispanics, and we look down on people that don't look like us or don't talk like us or dress like us, but yet we play in the organ on Sunday morning. We teach in the Sunday school class. And what's happened is we don't have no love in the church and so we're out of balance and people come in and they say something is wrong. This church is not balanced. That's good. That's How are you going to stand there and tell God you love Him and shun somebody because they don't have the money you have? Right. Or because they don't look like you do? Or because they got a long beard and ride a Harley Davidson motorcycle? Or... 
Shadow or Night Star or what, Yamaha or Honda or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? People don't want to hear what we got to say because we're out of balance. We're walking around like this. God loves you. God loves you as long as you fit in this box. That ain't what Jesus said. Jesus said the way into the box is love me and love your neighbor. Everything else does not matter. Because all the law and all the prophecies hinge on you loving God and loving your neighbor. Love balances the scales. I may have an addiction problem. Ah, y'all don't want me to say nothing. Woo, I'm going to dig it out this morning. I, I, may, I may have a, a pornography problem. Got real quiet. But I love God and I love my neighbor. And God looks over my problem because he's not through with me yet. The church judges me because of my problem. God knows he's already solved my problem. It might be next Monday before I realize how to solve the problem, but God loves me enough to get me to next Monday. The church will drop you on Friday, but God, I'm preaching better than y'all letting on, but God loves you so much, he knows Monday's coming. And the whole time you're typing away and you're looking and God is, 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 is grieved and your spirit is grieved. The love of God, when you push delete and cut that computer off, the love of God is still there saying, come on, son. Come here. Come here, son. Don't, 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 don't walk away from me. Don't walk away. God don't love me. God hates me. God's mad at me. No, that's the church. Come on. That's denominational thinking. That's religious thinking. That is not Bible thinking. Because the Bible says, while you are yet a sinner, Christ died for you. Why? I'm going to tell you why. Now, let me say this. Because we say, oh, well, since God loves me, and I love my neighbor, those that look like me and act like me, then I'm okay. I can do whatever I want to do because, Pastor, you said everything hinges on love. Yeah, but love requires some things. Y'all should have shouted when you had a chance. Love requires some things. That's what we're going to talk about over the next couple of weeks. Let's talk about number one. What does love require? Love requires justice. Oh, Lord. Justice. Isaiah 45, 21 says that God is a just God and a Savior. If He is a just God, God's love requires Him to be just. Now what does that word just mean? Just means to be impartial, fair, equal, and an enforcer of the law. Uh-oh. So that, do, that means that I can't, you, you're telling me, preacher, that I can't just live like a hellion on earth and then when I stand before God, I say, God, now you love me. You said you love me, so you can't send me to hell if you love me. How many of you have heard that? God won't send you to hell if he loves you. What kind of God would send you to hell if he loves you? Either he loves you enough to let you in or he don't love you and you're going to go to hell. But it can't be both. Yes, it can be both because love requires justice. It requires him to be fair, impartial, and impute the law. So when you stand before God, he's going to ask you one question. Have you accepted my son Jesus as the, as the sacrifice for your sin? Did you love him? Did you love your neighbor? Is the blood of Christ applied to your life? If it is no, then love requires him to impute the law. Are you here? Can, can we teach a little bit? It's his justice that comes from his love that requires him 
to obey what He has said. Somebody say amen. Amen. You can want to lose weight all you want to. You can have a desire to be skinny. You can look at all the magazines that's been photoshopped. Is that what they call it? Huh? Spray painted makeup. And you look at it every day and say, I want that. I want to be skinny. I want to wear that. I want to wear this. All you want to. You keep eating Oreo blizzards. The law of calories is going to overtake your desire for a bikini. Am I right or am I wrong? Isn't that right? The love of God requires Him to be just. Now that's good and bad. That means if you do what His Word says for you to do, He is required to to, to bless you. Required to bless you. That, That justice will motivate a Rosa who has been told you have weeks to live But the justice of God wakes her up in the middle of the night with a scripture that says, I'll bless you, I'll heal you. Your your healing will spring forth speedily. And she all of a sudden is moved by the justice of God. I'm going to bring an offering to the Lord. God has to respond favorably because he's just. You understand that? Am I doing all right this morning? I get so sick of people. I mean, there's, you know what? The one of the fastest growing religions are right now is called inclusion, which means everybody Buddhists, Hindus, Mar, Mar, uh, who's the Manson dude that killed everybody? Them, Charles Manson. All of us, Hitler, everybody's going to heaven. Because when Jesus said it is finished, he died for everybody's sin. And this is hell. We're living in hell right now. So when we die, we all go to heaven. No matter who your God is, Jesus already paid the price. It's called inclusion. Everybody's included. And it's based on the love of God. That God, if he loves you, could not punish you for eternity. However, love requires justice. I love my son Noah. I love my daughter Reagan. The love for the both of them requires me to treat them the same. If I'm going to be just. Isn't that right? Can I give you some scripture? 1 John 2, 5 says this, But whosoever keeps his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know that we are in him. What does it say? He that keeps the word, in that person that is keeping the word of God, that is living their life according to the word of God and the law of God and the principles of God, in him, God's love is perfected. Justice. Does everybody see that? 1 John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. Thank God he didn't leave that out. Right there he tells you that if, you, if the love of God is perfected in you, doing what God's called you to do as a Christian, sold out to him, should not be grievous. That's right. It's just hard to be a Christian. No, it... Really? It's hard to be blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Blessed coming in and blessed going out. It's hard to walk in divine health and healing. It's hard to walk in faith, hope, and love. It's hard to walk in the steps of God that promises blessing and prosperity. That's hard. No. It's hard to have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. That's what's hard. 
Somebody say amen. Because you got one foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom. You're open to get kicked somewhere that's going to hurt you. Somebody say amen. amen. Walk around straddled and see what happens. You're going to get cramps with place you didn't even know you had muscles. Somebody say amen. Love requires justice. God has to be just. He loves you, but he loves everybody else too. He loved Belshazzar. Somebody say amen. He loved him. But there come a time where his heart turned from him, his mind turned from him, his soul turned from him, and the balance tilted. His love for God was, was absent, therefore he was lacking. Does everybody see that? Can I give you one more? Love requires reciprocation. Love requires reciprocation. Reciprocation is a response or a gesture to an action or an action by, ma- by making a corresponding one. A response or, or to a gesture or action by making a corresponding one. Reciprocation, which means you're going to do this because I know you. I'm not Pastor David right now. I'm just David. Okay, if I do this to you, what are you going to do to me? <laughs> That's reciprocation. I had to tell her that because she would have never hit me otherwise. You see that? She just reciprocated my action. Amen? I slap you, you going to slap me? That's reciprocate. Love requires reciprocation. That means if God gave me something, I'm to give him something. You can't tell me you love God, got saved, full of the Holy Ghost, gave your heart to the Lord, and you didn't change. That's right. Come on. Come on. Let, me, Come on. let me read you some scripture. John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world, He loved you enough to give. He gave His Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish, have everlasting life. First John 4, nine says this, In this, this action was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might have life through Him. 1 John 3.16 says this, Hereby perceive we the love of God. Here's how we perceive the love of God. Because He laid down His life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Reciprocation. God loves you enough to put action to His words. Now you should love Him enough to put action to your words. He gave His Son's life. All He's asking is for your life. It's good. It's good. Somebody say amen now. If He gave a life, you're to give a life. It's reciprocation. And love requires it. Right? If you love me and Stephanie, then your love for us requires you to reciprocate our love for you. Which means, if we're going to love you enough to have your back, you should love us enough to have our back. If we're going to love you enough to believe in you, even in your times of stumbling, you are required to love us when we fall. That's good. That's good. Somebody say amen. Because love requires reciprocation. Okay? You got it? You got that? All right, let's flip it back to God. If love requires reciprocation, and He says that I'll have whatsoever I ask, Is that what his word says? If he says we're to agree on earth touching any one thing, you shall have it. If I love him enough to believe his word and to stand on his word, his love has to reciprocate my faith. If I believe in faith, he has to perform in faith. Who I feel the Holy Ghost. It's reciprocation. 
If I'm willing to give up stuff for him, he has to be willing to fill me with stuff. I'm going to let you think about that just for a minute. This is the only two points I'm going to get through today. Hallelujah. I'm talking about we building an army. Hallelujah, Queenie. If I understand his God so loved the world, how many times we've heard that quoted? That his love for us produced action. He has not changed. He has not changed. His love for you still requires Him to act. Hallelujah! You get that, P. Rick? His love, that's going to stop your stinking mentality that you're, you're burdening God when you go to Him with your problems and your cares and your needs. Well, he don't, you know, he's got bigger fish to fry. These people starving in Nigeria. They are, and you can't do nothing about it. But that don't mean you got to starve with them. Y'all don't want to say nothing. That's good preaching. I, one of my buddies went through something a couple of weeks ago. And every time I talk to him, He's always going back to the mistakes he made. Amen? He can't get free because he keeps throwing himself on the altar. Do you understand that? God wants to free him, forgive him, restore him. But every time somebody speaks life into him, but I did this, and he throws himself on the altar. God can't get on the altar if you're on the altar. Do you hear that? God ain't going to lay on the altar with you either. You're going to sacrifice yourself or He's going to sacrifice His Son. Do you understand what I'm saying? We don't let God reciprocate our love. He wants to. He says He takes... He takes pleasure in the prosperity of His people. He can't reciprocate His pleasure to us because we're laying on the altar of sacrifice when He's already paid for that. I'm dealing with religion this morning. Oh, stinking thinking. Amen? Hallelujah. He loves us. And His love requires reciprocation. Okay, what does God want from me then? He tells us, in everything we give, let it be done with thanksgiving and praise and worship to the Lord. All He wants is for you to love Him. This whole Christianity thing hinges on one word. Love. I tell our men every Wednesday, we have a small group, love Jesus every day of your life. See, we're, we're always worried about fixing each other and fixing ourselves and, you know, 12 steps to staying free and 8 steps to getting free. And we're all about worried about getting free, staying free. I'm going to tell you how to get free and how to stay free. It's not 12 steps, 8 steps, 6 steps. One step, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Just love Him. Just love Him. Just love Him. And then you'll go to touch the unclean thing and you'll go, oh man, I can't do that because I'll hurt him. And I don't want to hurt him. So I put that down. And when you put that down, love requires reciprocation. And when you lay something down, God can put something back into your hand. Yes. 
Hallelujah. And he's required to do it because he's just. Love balances the scales. You can be the worst sinner in that scale like this and you're wanting and all of a sudden you say, God, I love you. I give you my heart and I give you my life. And all of a sudden, that thing levels out because love always balances the scales. Amen? So we're going to talk about this for the next couple of weeks. Lord willing. You shut your mouth. (laughs) So what does love require today? We we talked about two of them. Justice, reciprocation. Hey, start placing demand on God. This week, say, God, now I love you. You're a just God. You got to do what this word says. And bless God, I've seen you take Mike from a pauper to a blessed. And if you can do it for Mike and Lynn, you got to do it for me. Somebody say amen. And the key to getting what Mike and Lynn has got is not their wisdom. It's not who they know. It's who they're in love with. That's right. Come on. That's right. Amen. Is that all right? Yes. I know we wouldn't holler and spitting and slap, you know, but that's good stuff. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. You good? Give me a worship team. Boy, I feel full. Do you feel full? I feel like we ate a steak this morning. Amen. Some of y'all still mad at me because I said you ain't going to fit in a bikini. I never said that. I will say God might not want you in a bikini. Amen. Your husband probably don't want you in a bikini. I mean, out, you know, outside. I'm going to go ahead and get out of that real quick. Wisdom is the principal thing. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. He gave His Son. Now your job is to reciprocate that and give Him your life. Somebody say amen. And you can't tell me in a group this big I don't know if you know it, but our church is growing and growing. Y'all don't know, but we added 30, 40 chairs. That's a lot of chairs. Amen. We're going to keep adding, amen. You can't tell me in a group this size that there's not somebody that's not 100% sure of your relationship with God there's somebody in here that you've come in this place and you're not 100% sure if you die today you go to heaven some of you it may be your first time here some of you you may have been going here for three years and it's just become a routine to you But I'm here to tell you this morning, if you haven't heard anything I've said, hear this. God loves you. He's a just God. And when man's sin come before him, there had to be a penalty for that sin. That penalty was Jesus Christ. And he gave him. Now it's your time to give back. Somebody say amen. Stand to your feet all over the building. We're going to sing a verse of a song. I know there's at least one person in this place 
that Jesus is not your Lord and Savior. I ask you not to leave this place without accepting Him as your Lord and Savior. That's what I ask you to do. What does that require of me? It requires you to love Him. That's all it requires for you to love Him. He so loved you, He gave a life. Love Him enough to give your life. That's all you got to do. Amen? Heads bowed, eyes closed as a sign of worship. As they sing this song, if you want to give your heart to Jesus, if you got some things you need to repent of this morning, if you haven't been loving God like you should, and you want to rededicate that commitment to the Lord, as they sing, get out of your seat, come stand up here with me, I want to pray with you. These altars are open, come. I want to pray with you. Come. Come on, I want to pray with you. You want to give your heart to Jesus. You want to give your life to Him. Come. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, stand with these. Come on. Don't leave this place. He wants to save you. He wants to touch you. Come on. He loves you. He loves you. Come on. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Come on, come on, come on. He loves you. Yes, he does. I want you to look at me. What was your name? Megan. I'm not promising I'm going to remember that because I should already know. I'm, I'm good with names in Jesus' name. Megan, we know from some good friends of ours, Bo and Courtney, their daughter. Where's Madison? Come on up here and stand with us. It's one of Madison's friends. Madison's interning here at the church. But Kayla had her small group at Madison's last night. They usually have it on Sunday, but they're going ice skating. So they had their small group. And you come to that small group last night. And I walked downstairs after, you know, they were kind of getting done with the small group. The whole basement was full of kids. I don't know how many was there. Young people. They're not kids. They're young men and women. Amen. But immediately I saw her first thing. And I saw her tears in her eyes. I said, man. Something's going on with her. And then here she comes today gives her life to the Lord Jesus Christ all because somebody had enough nerve to invite her to a small group and other people had enough nerve to be open I'm telling you you want to build the kingdom of God you're around people all day every day this here's one of Chuck's friends one of my friends too but Chuck called me a couple of weeks ago. He said, I'm bringing a guy with me in the morning and he needs God. That was three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. 
I gave an altar call. He was sitting right here on the front row. And I could just see God all over him, just dealing with him, you know, just loving on him. And he just stayed there. Then he had surgery on his knee and still came back to church last week. Preached last week, gave an altar call. Rosa came up. and Do you know he called me this week asking about you? Not even a covenant partner of church, only come. This is his third time. Called me concerned for her. That's the love of God. But he sat right back there. And then today, he come. Don't give up on your friends and your family. Don't give up on them. I want to tell you something. You have, you've, how old are you, 18? 19 years old. And for the better part of 19 years, you have lived under the identity of what your friends call you, what boys have called you, family have called you, society has called you. And they've been identifying you by your mistakes you've made. And that's who you've become. That's how you get your identity. You look in the mirror and you see yourself negatively because you listen to everybody else. But I'm here to tell you, Megan, you are not that same girl. You're not that same woman. Jesus said, if you would come, which you have today, He's taken all your past and it's gone. It's over. You've made mistakes, absolutely. You've made bonehead decisions, absolutely. We all have. But you know what? It's forgotten. It's over, it's gone, it's washed away. Don't get around any friends, any family, anybody that holds you to that mess. That is not who you are. You are new in Christ Jesus this morning. New. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. You are new. I don't, I'm having a hard time expressing what I'm feeling. God loves you. Your destiny is wonderful. You've been through a lot of pain, a lot of rejection. A lot of people have lied to you. I'm going to be here for you. I'm going to be here for you. And have failed you. Walked out on you. Run out on you. Talk about you. You've been through some bad stuff. But you're new today. You are new today. You are new today. Come here, step. Wrap your arms around her. Let the love of God fill her. How many believe Megan's new today? Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for our young people. Send revival to our young people. To our seniors, our juniors, our sophomores, our freshmen, our middle schoolers, our elementary schoolers. Send revival, oh God. Let them know, God, that you love them, you love them, you love them. And when people reject them, and when this world classifies them as a lost generation, may they know that you love them so much that you bring them to you with their sin, with their faults, with their failures. You bring them to you. And you wrap your arms around them and you say there is a better way. There's a better way.
Come on, stretch your hands this way. Father, we thank you for Steve. Father, I thank you this morning that Steve is a new creature in Christ Jesus today. That all of his sin is forgiven. All his failures, all the nastiness of his life is clean. Father, I thank you that you're surrounding Steve with men that'll love him for who he is. Come on, give me some men to come surround Steve right now. Some men that'll make a commitment to love him and teach him the things of God. Surround him. Can I get some young people come surround Megan? What's your name, sweetie? Father, I pray for Mackenzie right now in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you that she's a new creation in Christ Jesus. That old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. Her sins are forgiven and forgotten. She is a new creature in Christ Jesus. I call her the blessed of the Lord. I pray the protection of God to surround her and fill her and keep her all the days of her life. May this commitment that she's making to you today, may it keep her from sin. May it keep her from promiscuity. May it keep her in love with you all the days of her life. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Father, I bless these your people. If you, want to, if you want to know what church should look like, this is what church should look like. This is what church should look like. For God so loved us. He gave us the ability to have this. Does anybody else feel what I'm feeling this morning? You watching by live church, if you're not 100% sure if you died today, you'd go to heaven. Chat in right now and get Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God, will save you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Wherever you're at, let us know right now. We want to pray with you. Come on, let's sing. You're dismissed. We love you. Let's sing it.